Hello, BookTube. Well, as you can see, I have a guest. This is Zach from the Brattle Bookshop. Hello, BookTube. Care to uh, to give people a, a quick thumbnail of who you are and who the Brattle is, just for newcomers? Sure. Um, well, the Brattle uh, Bookshop is in downtown Boston. We're one of the oldest uh, bookstores in the country. It was originally founded in 1825. Um a different location in the city, but it's been a going concern in one way or another since then. Uh, at the moment, and since uh, my boss's father bought it in 1949, uh, it's been both a general used bookstore uh, and an antiquarian uh, rare bookstore. Uh, one of the few places remaining uh, that still uh, excel at both. I, I like to think we excel at both. I don't think I'll get much of an argument from you, but, no. uh, uh, and that, that's who we are. I've been here for, uh, almost to the day, 18 years. So, uh, I, uh, and, uh, I deal with, uh, a lot of the, uh, rare and antiquarian, uh, material. That's, that's most of, of what I do now. I'm in the basement in sort of our research area. Um, and uh, that's where I am today. And when it's as hot and humid as it is uh, the last couple of weeks in Boston, the basement is not the worst place to be. <laughs> uh, Zach could attest to the fact that when it comes to the Brattle being good at general and rare and antiquarian, I fall on one side of that equation and not across the board at all. <laughs> but It, it is not. <laughs> You're you're about as far to the um, to the general used book side of that uh, uh, of that spectrum as as anyone, uh, but that but that's good because uh, your personality is big enough to fill up the entire spectrum anyway. <laughs> but today we're talking about the other side of the spectrum, the spectrum that I don't know, the rare and antiquarian side. We yes. had a discussion a while ago about first editions. I have not stopped receiving emails about it saying, could you have that guy back <laughs> on the show? So we're going to talk about first editions again. Yeah, well, one what we talked about when we talked about first editions is how even though first edition as a term has become a kind of a colloquialism for rare book or valuable book in general, um, in practice, um, that's that's not. Uh, really, uh, that's not realistic. That's not uh, the reality of what a fir what first edition means and what most first edition books are. Uh, to a collector, um, it's almost certainly not enough just to be a first edition, uh, to be the book that a uh, that the serious uh, collector is looking for, and also it's. It, not always necessary to be a first edition or rather it's often not necessary to be a first edition to be a collectible book so given the number of books that have been printed over the last 400 years would it be safe to say that uh most first editions are not valuable yes oh it's very safe to say and and by most we're talking an overwhelming majority <laughs> <laughs> and being a first last time in our last video if i try if i remember correctly i will leave a link to it down below but our last video, we were talking about all the different weird, obscure variations on a first edition that there can be. And I, before we get to more of that, sure. I was wondering, so first edition and all of those variations, first printing, first impression, first kiss, whatever it is, all yeah. of those things are one metric of making a book collectible, right? There are others, like yeah. flaws in printing or inscriptions. Mm -hmm. things like that right there are other things that you so could there be, are, you could be a book collector that doesn't care about first editions absolutely you you could you could be a book collector who just cares about how the book is bound which has which almost always has nothing to do with the circumstances of how the printed portion of it um it came into being it might not have anything to do with the text of the book at all uh Certainly someone who collects signed uh, and inscribed material might be might be 
concerned with uh, addition in sort of a secondary sense, but it's not what they're collecting. What And both those, something like the binding and inscriptions or annotations or uh, other things that are specific to a certain copy of a book. It's sort of a different uh, species of, of collecting, what, what we what might be called copy specific collection or collecting. So collecting things that are particular or unique to a particular copy of a book. Whereas in addition, uh, people who collect first editions, you're uh, looking at uh, not necessarily copy specific, uh, uh, a, a, a copy, <laughs> excuse me, copy specific collecting. So, but more you're looking into, um, you know, the circumstances of how the entire um, bookmaking process, you're, you're looking at um, variations within the text and how it was produced, rather than a certain copy of a book and its particular history. Now, would I be wrong? Would I be my my overly grubby sale lot utilitarian self to say that <laughs> most people who collect first editions don't read them? They collect they get, read they get a reading you, copy. Reading yes, copy. you mean they don't read that specific they don't copy. Read that book. That that book is something else. They're not getting it because they like it. I, I'd say I'd say most people, although I it's hard to generalize. You could probably say most. I love but, generalizing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, what do you mean it's, it's hard to generalize? <laughs> it's the easiest thing in the world. It's easy as falling out of bed. <laughs> it's it's hard not to it's hard to generalize and not be wrong a lot. <laughs> but maybe I'll say that. Um, but yes, there there are people who collect first editions and they want to keep that object pristine. They want to buy uh, a copy of that book in as close to pristine condition as they can, and they want to keep it that way. So if the text is important to them, they'll usually read a different copy. Although I, it's it's hard not, at least for me, I, I collect certain uh, first editions and certain rare books, and I, I kind of look through them all the time. Um, I'm, I'm careful, and, I, and I'm gentle. I'm not going to do anything that's going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, sit my coffee cup on, on top of the binding or or do anything like that. I'm probably not going to read it in bed. Uh, but I look through the books all the time. That's the the physical nature of the book is is part of, uh, of, of collecting books for me. So even the people who wouldn't sit down and read their first edition copy cover to cover, I suspect are still handling it in some way uh, from time to time. I knew a book collector in California once, years and years and years ago, who was the stereotypical book addict, the one that you read about in essays. He collected rare and first editions, and especially presentation copies. He loved presentation copies, and those mm -hmm. he archivally preserved. And then he yeah. would get a reading copy of the same book because he liked to read it. But then he would yeah. get a beater copy, what he referred to as a beater copy, <laughs> a ragged old edition. And he would do that. I would say, well, isn't that a reading copy? And he'd say, well, the beater copy is for, and I'm not absolutely sure that I'm not going to hurt the book. Yeah. <laughs> Three right. copies of, of every book. And I miss him. Yeah. And I don't mean to be ghoulish, but I'm glad he died the way he did. His books killed him. A, a yeah. wall of books collapsed on him. Really? Yeah. Although, although I have to say he is an interesting example of uh, what I always tell people that books can be used in, in many different ways. <laughs> and, e and e even though you can you can look at his collecting habits and say, well, it's a little much. That's that's getting too that's on the wrong side of, of the maniacal <laughs> line. But from his perspective, each of those three copies served a different purpose in his life. So I I get it. But so in your experience, you must encounter lots of first editions. Tons in of first jobs. Editions. You must encounter lots of first editions, including some that are that you immediately know are valuable. Yes. So what are the tales of heartbreak? Or as we say in Boston, heartbreak. 
what 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 other do you have any stories or have you heard any stories about really valuable first editions that are casually unknowingly ruined by their owners somebody doesn't know what they have somebody does put a coffee a coffee cup on mm -hmm. a book they don't know is valuable yeah or maybe does one of those obnoxious from the library of stamp embossers uh, oh well i mean i i i have numerous examples of people who and I, I'm hesitant to say did damage to their uh, collectible books by uh, by means of their ownership signature or some sort of marks of ownership because what they really did was uh, damage their resaleability was damage sort of their future value which I can understand having a, a uh, fulfilling collection and really enjoying collecting books and, and not caring at all about what the book might be worth uh, down the line. Um, it, one example is one thing that one thing that I, I tend to have a pet peeve about is people, you know what a, a book plate is, people's ex libris plates in books. It's, it's a, a practice going back basically as long as uh, People have held private collections, so certainly before uh, before the advent of, of printing, people would mark ownership in in their books. I've I get really frustrated by people who have giant book plates, book plate that even in your sort of standard hardcover size book. Um, it take up most of the paste down end paper. You, you can barely see the end paper underneath this person's giant um, uh, ex, ex libris um, uh, plate. So that that can be frustrating. Um, I've, I've also just uh, coincidentally, I've, it's I often find the people with the best book collections who have those tend to have the most unassuming book plates. Um, <laughs> it's sort of, uh, the, the old, the old, uh, the old line about, uh, sports writing, the smaller, the ball, the better, the writing sort of the, the smaller, the book plate, the better, the book. I understand the idea. It's a very cozy, very personal idea. Put your own book plate in every book you have. It's very, it's not AD 2024. It's more AD 224. When it's, it's you'd only have come possible. across a hundred books in your lifetime, you well, yeah, you might, you no, you you wouldn't probably come across a hundred books in your lifetime. Um, so I, yeah, I I understand it. I and people enjoy doing it. It's sort of a it's collecting uh, important or, or noteworthy people's books in their book plate. A completely uh, additional area I, of collecting. I had the brief That's flirtation. Completely. I got, I got a block of lovely uh, blank book plate stickers from mm -hmm. the Boston Public Library showing the, the McKim Mead and White facade. Yeah. And I thought, wouldn't this be nice to, to finalize my collection by doing, by using these? And the thing that stopped me was your shop. Yeah. Because I went one morning and found 10 of them in your sale lot. I thought, oh, wait, I'm not keeping these things. So this, don't well, bother to do it. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 would, I would never discourage people from uh you know from uh from putting book plates in their books but a few guidelines as as a bookseller um and someone who often reminds people that their books uh certainly can have lives after they're done with them um, <laughs> very diplomatic those... <laughs> very diplomatic your books make... you listeners what Zach is trying to say is your books are going to outlive you. <laughs> you have dark <laughs> circles under your eyes. You are obviously in severe cardiac disease. Your books <laughs> are going to outlive you. <laughs> so, so treat them accordingly. Yeah. Well, but I, I'd say try to try to be as unobtrusive as possible in your books. Um, you know, try to follow the Hippocratic imperative first, do no harm. So when you when you said the word stick book plate stickers. From the butt that it sent a chill up my spine. The word sticker. You want to be really, really careful about putting any adhesive on the materials of your book. Um, if if something is a sticker, don't don't put it on your book. 
Um, if you're going to put um, uh, put your book plate in a book, the, uh, the term that uh, is us- that we usually use is tipped in. Tipped in, yeah. Which means you can just put a, a small bit of, um, of acid-free, non-toxic glue. You can find it anywhere where it's not terribly expensive. Uh, just put a, just a little dab will do you. Put it on. Um, it, that way, if you ever want to take it off, you can do it without damaging whatever uh, material it's pasted on. If somebody else wants to do it, they can without uh, causing too much damage. It's it's a good way to to think about that. Try not to damage the materials. <laughs> I knew an avid book collector in New York when New York was a haven for used bookstores. Do you remember those days when it would be whole streets of used bookstores? I, 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 when, I lived in, when I lived in New York, I guess. I, yeah. And this is not, it's, we're talking 2002, 2003, so not ancient history. Yeah. I had an email address. It's not, not yeah, that I knew, long. I knew a New York book collector, just this hunched over gnome of a guy who went to every bookstore, bought mm-hmm. everything, was interested in everything, read everything. He was great to talk to about books and i i used to tell him that very thing you know you're these book plates these ornate book plates of yours why don't you just tip them in until mm-hmm. one day in chinatown over a cheap lunch he said you want me to tell you what you can tip in and i said no i don't <laughs> that just stop the whole <laughs> I, I think, yeah i think that phrasing made it very clear <laughs> it was we had reached the end i think we had yep. reached the end but so so to get back to first editions, yeah, you you are an active employee in a very active antiquarian bookstore. Like you say, mm-hmm. most of these things have moved online, haven't they? The idea uh, that yes. this would be a bookstore that you would walk into where you could buy a copy of, I don't even know, a, a Bob Marley biography, mm-hmm. a cookbook. You know, George Washington. Lots of, lots of cookbooks. You could walk into this bookstore and buy those things for four or five dollars, but you could also go upstairs to the third floor and buy something really valuable. Yep. So you see a lot of that stuff. What is the frequency here? Are when when if we're talking about you seeing a first edition mm-hmm. that is notable, something to make your eyebrows. A first edition that matters. matters. A first What's that? that matters. Does that happen? Matters once? in terms of in terms of the price that we're gonna that we're gonna try and get for it. Is that uh, once a week? Is that once a month? Oh no, no, much more frequently than than that. Although it it really depends because there is a ton of variation in what we bought at different times. We might have uh, a month where we buy four or five uh, libraries that uh, that have really good books in them. Uh, and there might be a, a couple months where we buy just general lot of books after general lot of books. Um, so there's no there's no good way to sort of put a, a frequency on it. Um, but it is frequent. It is. Oh, you know, it is. It is. Frequent. Yeah. Now you have areas of specialty, right? We've gone over that on this channel. You, there are there are first and rare editions, rare chains of provenance that you know better than others. Yes. Yeah. So over time, do you develop a kind of all purpose spidey sense? Even if it's so when you encounter something, let's say it's a general book sale, but you encounter an item that is not an area of your antiquarian expertise. Will have you reached a point where it will still set off an instinct? Now there's something about this. This is, you won't. Yeah. In other words, how many times does uh, someone out on a brattle hall just make a clean miss of something? Just just plainly miss something. But, it certainly happens. Um, I, although I I will say uh, what happens more often is they'll miss. Someone will miss the fact that it's not quite the right uh, right version of that book. It's not quite. A first edition, hmm. or if it is, it's not quite the right state of the dust jacket, or uh, not quite the right printing, some something like that. Uh, but it it does happen because there are just so many books. But w- one thing I'll say is, 
the way I approach a lot of, let's say I go to go to a house and there are a thousand books and I'm looking through a thousand books. It's almost like if, if it's a typical house, maybe 930 of them won't even register on my retinas because I've seen them so many times. I, I, they, I don't need to think about them. Um, and the whatever smaller number of, of the total will and it'll it'll either be I'll recognize that that could be valuable let me check the addition points let me check the condition or I don't think I've seen that and that's really where the spidey sense goes off it's not so much recognizing things that I know are valuable um it's recognizing things that I don't recognize right because tens of millions of books have gone through your hands yeah, so the very, I mean, the very fact that you don't recognize something automatically makes it interesting. At, at this point, yeah, it 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 does because I even in a typical week, definitely in a typical week, sometimes in a typical day, I'll handle more books than most people will handle in maybe in their lifetime. You know, I might handle two thousand books in a day. Um, so you just the same sort of things pop up and. Uh, and I recognize them as common, so it makes the outliers stand out even more, more starkly. And that's where you have to take a cl close look, um, do some research, uh, really take some time. Whereas with most books, they don't require much time to deal with them, at least in the sense of, here's what I can pay, here's what I uh, think we'll get. You're almost describing some sort of Sisyphean nightmare where the books are always the same. The cover jackets are always the same for 50 years. My jokes have been the same. It's all just this one endless circle <laughs> with only a few glimmers of unusual mixed in. No, that's, that's not. No, I see that. That's interesting that you would take it that way. Cause I don't think of it that way at all because even if it's the, yes, if it's all just sort of general books after general books that are perfectly fine, but I've, I've seen them a million times. In most places, I'll see something that's at least interesting, or it's an interesting copy of a book I know well, or it's, oh, that's the, that's the best dust jacket I've ever seen on that one, or, um, or that might be the world's worst copy of. <laughs> of I've actually that. been at the shop. I've actually been at the buying table when someone brings in just they made an appointment. They bring in a bunch of books, and yeah. somebody at the table set realizes that has that moment. Oh wait, this yeah. is. I need to this talk to other people. I I'm not going to wing this on my own. I need to call somebody, I call right. you up from the basement or whatever. <laughs> That's it's a wonderful moment. It's a very interesting moment. Uh, yeah. Did you mention? Uh, the right condition. Yes. That's another question that I had about first editions. Are, mm -hmm. I imagine that first editions are a lot like the buying market for anything else, where there are going to be stratas based on what you can pay. Yes, that's right. So the, I imagine there is a market for less than pristine first editions, where it is the oh, first absolutely. edition, it is the valuable item, but it's in worse shape. So you're paying. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, just, I just priced this morning um a copy of uh a, a first edition copy of uh hunter s thompson's book on the hell's angels from uh 1967 which has the cool uh, leather leather jacketed biker on the on the front cover and it wasn't a great copy it it had uh you know, a little bleed from an old water stain because the top edge of that book's stained black so if you get a little water on it 40 years ago the black will seep a little way down into the margin. Um, the dust jacket was was decent, but had little chips at, at the edges here and there. So not a pristine copy, um, but it's a collectible book. A really nice copy of a first edition of that book, several hundred dollars. Um, whereas the one that I priced today is a hundred dollars, um, which is perfectly reason reasonable. Um, for a copy that's you know not a great copy and there are there, there, that... there are tiers for everything whereas if you find a copy where uh 
where uh, Thompson signed it um, or signed it and did one of his uh, crazy little doodles uh, or if he signed it to somebody um, uh, to somebody noteworthy, there are always tears um, that get reflected in, in the pricing of these. Imagine how valuable a copy of that book would be if in addition to all that, it had good prose. Good Lord, you could ask the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Alas, there are no copies of the book that have that particular collector's feature. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Okay. But so when, when you have something like that, let's say a first edition that's in, well, let's call it a more affordable bracket. So, you know, uh, some, something that is collectible. I mean, that you say it's collectible, maybe, I don't know. I don't even know. I mean, Valley of the Dolls, something like that, where you get you get a a, a first edition that isn't in the pristine condition. Do those things tend to stick around the shop longer or shorter than the ones that are well, affordable? Steve, do you, do you I find I collectors will... holding out for the perfect yeah. ones. Yes. So, well, I'll, I'll answer. There are two questions embedded in there. The first one is yes, certain collectors who uh, who are able to afford the better copies will hold out for a better copy and pay the premium for the. Uh, ones in better condition. But collectors who are just looking for a copy and might not be able to compete for the best ones um, certainly will uh, will buy up, you know, decent, but certainly on the middle to lower end copies. You asked before that though, um, are those the kind of things that stick around the shop forever? Um, and my answer is not if I have anything to do about it, <laughs> because uh, they they will if you don't price them accordingly. In other words, if you don't price it as a copy that is going to be bought by somebody who's looking for a bargain on that particular title, then yes, they'll stick around forever. If you price it taking into account the flaws and taking into account that, especially with modern first editions, um, almost none of them are actually rare. What's rare is to have an, ex an excellent copy of them. So something like, um, you know, any, you know, name a novel that was issued um, in a dust jacket from the last hundred years or so. Um, most of them are pretty uh, obtainable, even if they're expensive. So if you have one that, uh, for whatever reason, is not the ideal copy, you're competing with loads and loads of other copies that are kind of the same. So if you don't distinguish your copy by price, it will stick around forever. And when you mention an ideal copy, is yeah. that the attitude on the part of a lot of first edition collectors is that they want something completely pristine, something that looks exactly like it first appeared? And if that's the case, if that is the attitude for a lot of these collectors, then will inscribed copies or presentation copies, will that be something they don't want? So that's uh, actually decreasing? I, the I have not found that. Because they're almost, how do I say this? They're almost different products. The same the, if if you have a beautiful copy of, see now I'm trying to I'm trying to think of a book that you really don't like, and I can <laughs> <laughs> I can I'm trying to trying to trigger you. Okay, uh, let let's say let's say they you love have, it. The audience loves it when you trigger me. <laughs> I, I, this this is a good one. Um, let's say you have a a beautiful uh, first edition copy of Slaughterhouse Five in a dust jacket that it's it was issued in kind of a a cream dust jacket. So very often it tones darker. Um, it, uh, it fades. It's, it's tough to find one in a really um, uh, as issue dust jacket um, just because of the, the coloring and, and the materials. Um, if you find just a perfect pristine first edition copy, it's almost a different 
product than one that Vonnegut signed and and did a little uh, asterisk asshole doodle in. Um, it there it's the same book, it's the same novel, it may be the same edition, uh, but it's it's sort of a it's it is almost like a different product. Um, Still and, waiting for my perfect edition of that book. I, I'm still waiting for the perfect binding, which is one inch all around of quick drying concrete. And I haven't found it yet. That would be the perfect way, really, to to preserve that book. Would be yeah, to, but how would you know it's actually in there? The rock will start to crack through the concrete. It's that bad. <laughs> so, but when, so what you talked about Vonnegut and his stupid doodles, do books like that start to cross over into the territory of the Kraken of the uh, the people we're trying not to name so that we don't invoke them, autograph hunters. Oh yes, yes, it it does. Um, but I don't know, it it seems not as much as as I would have thought. I guess um, we certainly have customers who are interested in signed books. Um, and we also sell autograph uh, material, manuscripts, letters, things like that. And there, about, there's, there, there's a fair amount of crossover. What about I'll, Sith Lords who cross the line? What about the ones who use an X-Acto knife to cut out a signed front page? Oh, book? God, it's been... Ha it's Because that's happened. what they're going to sell. And that's what they're going to collect. Yes. And they don't care about the book. Which They, they don't care about the book. Yeah, I, it certainly happens The we call that a, a clipped signature or, or they'll clip a, a clip a signature from this, something from, uh, you know, a, from a check or from an uninteresting little note and uh, paste it into a first edition of a book. It goes the other way too. Um, yeah. It's, it's a bummer. It's, it's not something that I would ever encourage anyone to do. People but it's also clip happens. artwork, right? What's that? People also clip artwork from books. I'm sure, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they do. <laughs> it's it's a bummer because, I, again, ideally, a lot of collecting should have to do with the history of the object. And if you're screwing around like that, you're screwing around with all of its contextual history. So what are you? What really are you doing? It's. Did you uh, do you set yourself a budget? You mentioned that you do a little bit of collecting. Yeah. Do you, do you set yourself a budget? Yeah, it's pretty low. It's pretty low. And do you ever end up acting like the uh, the parish priest? Do you get collectors that contact you online or in the shop and you know, you can tell that they also set a budget and that they are exceeding it? You're, or is this all the odd emptor? You, you, yeah. I'm not going to take care of your checkbook. Right. Well, sometimes... I. I oftentimes, if, if somebody's coming in, whether they're looking for themselves or whether they're looking for a gift, we ask people all the time, uh, do you have a budget and, and what is it? And then you sort of steer them into books at that level. Um, that happens all the time. It's, it's really helpful because you don't want to be, uh, it's, you don't want to miscommunicate there. You don't want to show waste yours and their time by showing them a book that they can't afford or show them one that's not nearly as good as they want. I often get the sneaking suspicion when people at the Brattle, as they often do, just dismissively say to me, oh, you don't want that. Oh, come on. You don't want that. I often get the suspicion that it's be not because they're looking after my budget, but because they're trying to get me out of the shop. <laughs> <laughs> this visit's gone on long enough oh you don't want that oh, you're never gonna look no. at that <laughs> no but i i i i'm thinking of of a couple in particular but i tell there are a couple of collectors that i work with that i much more often will tell them no you don't want to buy that book don't buy that book it doesn't belong in your collection then i'll tell them you you should buy this book and when it comes to those collectors I'm sure that I know some of the people that you're talking about. Yeah. Not to be not to not to be too macabre, but those collections of theirs are coming back to you, right? Um, well, certainly they're coming back to you. They're coming oh, it's the rule that I hear from you all the time, and that I heard from employees at the Brattle before you yeah. was that your relatives are not interested in your books. You might dream about that, but they're not. 
Yeah, because people people who collect things tend to be passionately interested in some something that that collection reflects, and uh, yeah, you, you, those things aren't hereditary. No, <laughs> no. But so they're going to come back to you, or or somebody like me. But how many people? How many places are there like the Brattle anymore? Not too many, but there are lots of auction houses. There are lots of uh, different different things but yeah yeah you know, mm. we're all just sort of stewards for a lot of this stuff and the when you're out i don't want to i don't want to get cut off in mid-sentence but <laughs> if you encounter one of these rare books one of these first editions or whatnot out on a buy yeah the tenor of the conversation with the seller changes immediately right not usually not the tenor of it i i try to you know be pretty middle of the road regardless of the um level of the material but it's something that you, you have to point out right uh, just ethically comes a point yeah. when you take them aside and say this item is more valuable than you think it is or this or this this item is more valuable than the sum of everything else <laughs> oh my <laughs> oh, 